Welcome to Slate School and our panel discussion entitled A Deep Dive into Curiosity and Creativity. Slate School is to, committed to excellence in education and we are delighted to present the Education Ideal Lab, which is the new unique virtual series that is free and open to the public. This thought leading event convenes leaders, change makers, and participants from all sectors of education and innovation. Thank you for joining us. We're Absolutely thrilled to have all of you with us here today. My name is Julie Mountcastle and I'm head of school at Slate School. I'd like to briefly introduce you to Slate School, then we'll review the panel logistics and then we'll hear from our five amazing panelists. Slate School is an independent 501c3 nonprofit elementary school where education is focused on cultivating creativity, fostering ingenuity, and inspiring a deep passion for lifelong learning. At Slate School, we have formed a community that is constantly striving to improve practice, to create meaningful educational experiences for learners of all ages, and to change the landscape in education. Slate School convenes experts for important, authentic conversations about education, and these online dialogues, like today's, are free and open to the public. We are absolutely delighted to have all of you with us here today. I believe once again, we have learners joining us from six continents. So now I'll describe the basic logistics of our panel. We have five amazing panelists and they have a wealth of expertise to share with you during this next hour. Uh, each of our panelists today will give a two minute or so introduction about themselves, their current role and their key guidance and thoughts about curiosity and creativity. Uh, we'll then proceed with the panel discussion and we'd invite you to submit additional questions as comments on Facebook and um, if some of those come up we'll be able to uh, perhaps use some of those to ask our panelists today as well. So we'll proceed with having our panelists introduce themselves um, in alphabetical order I suppose. I am delighted to introduce you to our first panelist Miguel Gonzalez. Good, good, good afternoon. Yeah thank you thank you. Um, yeah my name is Miguel Gonzalez I'm the director of Embark Education, which is an innovative micro middle school uh, based in Denver, Colorado. Um, our middle school is embedded in two small businesses, a bike shop and a coffee shop where students learning is intertwined with the real world shop operations. Um, and you know that really ties with our conversation today around um, curiosity um, and creativity as you know through those authentic learning experiences where students are able to take vulnerable risks and see the real world outcomes um, has been a truly incredible to see unfold um, across this year i'm so fortunate to lead uh, lead this community and and really really happy to be a part of this panel thank you awesome miguel thank you for joining us very excited to hear more about that uh, and our next uh, our, our next panelist is ulka joshi hansen hello ulka Hi, good morning, Julie, and hi to all of our learners. Uh, my name is Olka. I am currently Chief Strategy Officer with Boundless, which is a new global nonprofit that was co-founded by Sir Ken Robinson, Ted Dinter Smith, and Emily Liebtag. And we are really aimed at trying to engage communities and educators in locally based but collaborative work that is necessary to kind of move towards the transformation in education that Sir Ken and others have been talking about for decades, um, but that we think in this moment of COVID and the opening that, that it provides um, may finally have its moment. Uh, by way of background, I am an educator by training. And so if during the course of this conversation, it sounds like I know answers, that's not true, but I do love to ask questions and I love to throw out ideas because I think it's in these conversations that we generate um, kind of solutions and ways of moving forward. But I, you know, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. My, I'm the child of immigrants. I was an English language learner and I was the strange child who really loved to kind of read and learn about things that people were like, why are you learning about ESP or astrology or witch burnings or whatever? And I'm, um, it's been fun in my professional life and my research um, to kind of think about the ways in which those strands of my identity, my family, my background, the experiences kind of come together in new ways. And it's something that I um, am trying to provide for my own kids. So thank you for having me here. Looking forward oh, to the conversation. Very excited. Very excited. Thank you for coming. And uh, our next panelist, Kathy Hirsch-Pasek. Kathy, welcome. 
Thank you, thank you. And wow, I just am so inspired by you guys already. This is so cool. And Julie, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm a professor of psychology at Temple University. And I also work as a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And I study a lot of different processes in little kids and how they learn is at the core of it. And most recently, I think I started a whole thing on play where my students told me I'm definitely the play doctor. <laughs> and having uh, now moved to incorporate the study of curiosity and creativity into our understanding of play, just how do we nurture it. And as one of the initiatives that we've just started, and uh, all could be fun to talk to you someday about this fun one, I think Ken would like it as well. We are building playful learning landscapes where we are working with communities to co-design um, bus stops and sidewalks and all sorts of different public spaces to create the new piazza. And as a new piazza with places you have to go anyway, we think we can put the cognitive science right into the environment and stimulate the kinds of conversations that will spark playful learning, curiosity, and creativity. Excellent. Awesome. Well, welcome. So glad you're here. And now we have Wendy Ostra. Hi, Wendy. Hi, thank you so much. I, it is such an honor for me to be on a panel with all of you. I'm so excited to hear what you have to say. I am an associate professor in the Hutchins School of Liberal Studies, which is at Sonoma State University. And in a way, the Hutchins School is something like uh, the Slate School, but in higher ed, I think. I think we have a lot in common. It was started in the 60s, and it was an experimental school within a school based on flattening hierarchies between professors and students. And so all of our learning happens in the seminar and all of our learning happens in ways that we can't necessarily predict. So we, we read texts and we view texts and we experience things together and then we create meaning together. And one of the most exciting things of teaching in Hutchins for me is that we're encouraged to teach classes on things that we are not expert in. In fact, things that we know nothing about but we're just wildly interested in. And so we, we meet our students together as a community of learners. I'm also uh, trained as a developmental psychologist and a lot of my students are gonna be teachers. So we have kind of a, a future teacher track in our program. And it's been my, my work has been really doing this, this kind of curating of the science of child development onto the ground to make that uh, what happens in the lab accessible to teachers and to, to you know, um, make those conversations happen and get, get that, kind of whip up that excitement of those two groups that traditionally don't really talk to each other too much. And I, my guess is I'm on the panel because I've written a book about curiosity, um, cultivating curiosity in K through 12 classrooms, which is, which is done a lot of that kind of curating of the science for, for people on the ground. So I'm, I'm so excited to learn from all of you and join this conversation. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. And now we'll welcome our last, but not our least, panelist, of course, Yong Zhao. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Uh, I'm Yong Zhao. I'm a, a professor at uh, University of Kansas, and uh, I also have uh, another job at uh, uh, University of Melbourne, the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. And uh, so uh, I, I came out of China, so I came to the U.S. I think uh, uh, Oka was uh, you were talking about as an immigrant. I, I came here when I was, uh, I think, 28 or 29. So it's different uh, uh, for me. And uh, I've been trying to um, promote and uh, support uh, educational changes in different countries. So uh, I have uh, done work in many different countries. And uh, so right now I'm very excited about this panel and uh, I'm very excited learning uh, what you guys have to share and happy to contribute what I might have uh, something to talk about. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. I'm gonna pop, I, I'm just gonna start, I'm get right at it because I think, I think there's, there's a lot to talk about here and uh, probably more than we have time for. In fact, um, but I'll just go back to Wendy for a second. I'm going to start with you, um, 
but as I've said to all the panelists, I, I want you to really have a conversation with each other. And if there's something of interest that um, gets mentioned by another panelist, please um, feel free to, to participate and, and have a conversation. Um, but I'll start with you, Wendy. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, how do you find, so we're talking about curi curiosity and creativity today, but I'm wondering about how you find them to be linked and how you find them to be disparate. Because I think, um, and I, I hope we could talk about this a little bit later too, you know, when, when we come across words like this and they become embedded in our, in our work here as educators, I think um, when they become buzzwords, they kind of get blurry and we, we, we kind of lose track of what the real meaning of these, these concepts are. So I'm wondering if you could talk to that curiosity and creativity, how they're the same and not so much. Sure, I would say for me, when I think about curiosity, I think first off that all learners are curious, all humans are curious. So I think of it as kind of a fundamental coming out of our drive to get to know our worlds, to be situated in an environment and ultimately maybe the survival reflexes that we have. So checking out the world is really important for us right away. And we see that with little kids be, where they have this immense, um, drive towards novelty, checking things out, right? You can't stop them from checking out their world and, and using their senses and embedding themselves in that. So I think of, of curiosity being very tightly linked to that, just that alive motivation, exploration that, that makes us um, living beings in a, in a situation. Um, sort of a, that fundamental brain state, because now we know that, that when you're in that space, of a curiosity state, you get this rush of dopamine in your in your brain, which is activating the things, you know, the prefrontal cortex is activating the, the parts of the brain that are gonna help you to be a better thinker, to be to take in information to solve problems. So so I, I sort of see curiosity as the engine for this, being in the world and and checking things out and knowing your surroundings. And then creativity maybe being one way that we can manifest. That, right make things happen take imagination and put it into action see the patterns make the connections take the risks so i i mean maybe one is one is sort of the prepared state and the other is is kind of how that how that plays when we're in the world more of a verb you know getting in there and doing things and yeah. and making yeah. things happen Awesome. Kathy, I saw you nodding. So I just want to ask you, do you, do you think that, do you think that these are things that can be taught? And um, yeah, I mean, of, of course they can be taught. Anything can be taught. Yeah. But you had a second in the end part. Well, I do. I do have an end to that because I, I, I agree, obviously, but, um, or maybe not obviously, but I agree. Um, but I, I guess I, I think maybe there are things that we're misunderstanding about how we nurture those 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 critical things creativity and curiosity what are we misunderstanding what what are we not what are we not getting right because you know we're, we're well, all i mean I, I think you know one thing we're assuming creativity and curiosity are all good and so that that's not necessarily true so that, that's i think that's a very important part is uh, curiosity and creativity can be damaging at the times, so so that's I think that's what we need to think about. So, so when we think about in you know, oh, then there's another uh, uh, um, perspective on it is that it's sometimes you we need to be very careful to say okay in certain for example cultures, certain countries, certain places, some sort of creativity may have to be you know uh, uh, controlled. You you cannot have that. So that's what you know a lot of times education plays a role. I'm not advocating for controlling creativity or curiosity. I'm just saying that, you know, you might have to be talk about the conditions, you know, the condition under which what type of creativity, what type of curiosity can be fostered is important. But there's another aspect when we talk about can be taught. And I see, so I think, I, I think it's the other way around. So for me, you can control creativity and curiosity. And you can also teach it to be better, you know, because you need domain specific, you need the content, you need skills, you all need all those kind of things. But what's really important is to say, okay, is to appreciate, as uh, uh, Wendy was saying, the uh, the instinctual 
desire for creativity and for curiosity, the instinctual, that, that's, that's the part I think that's we need to emphasize on that piece. That, so to educate is to create an environment that, at the, that boosts you know, better creativity and curiosity. Well, I, I will uh, build on that for just a second, also build on, on what you suggested, Wendy, because I think it was um, a really powerful statement. And it turns out that after looking at this under the microscope, so to speak, of developmental psychology for a while, um, what we've come up with is actually that curiosity and exploration may be the process part of creativity. So if you can think of creativity, and creativity has been all over the map and how we've defined it, but if you can think of it for a moment as kind of an outcome, okay? The question is how do you get to the outcome of being creative? Well, it seems to start with your being curious about something and asking a lot of questions, which then leads you to want to explore more and after you've explored more and then you choose one of the options of all the things that you've explored and you choose the best from among them, that would be your kind of best solution to the problem, the creative solution to the problem. I did want to pick up on Young's comment for just a moment because um, having looked at a lot of creativity and and how to nurture it. Uh, you know, a lot of what people are saying is that the best way to nurture creativity right now and curiosity right now is to allow for some ambiguity. So a lot of times what we do in our school classrooms is by over testing in this awful method that we have come up with for educating from the teacher at the front like a dictator, um, we ask for one right answer. And of course, most of the world isn't built on one right answer, whether it's co making coffee or your bike shop, right, Miguel? Um, there's many, many ways to, to skin it. And the first thing we have to do is get to a point of generating things, which we can do if we ask the right kind of questions. And in our field, we call those open-ended questions. They're not the kind of questions like, what color is this? blue. There are more like questions like, wow, how do you think they could have built that slide differently so it would go faster? And get a conversation started. And when you get that conversation started, like I'm sure you do, Wendy, in those seminars, then all of a sudden you see magic happen. And then after you've expanded out to zoom in, is, is the point where you hit creativity. Now, in some countries around the world, and um, I am told from one of my friends in China who started the very first children's museum in Beijing, that, well, everyone in the United States is talking about how great creativity is and curiosity is. She's tried to introduce it to parents in China, and they say, whoa. Uh, we're not sure we want that because we need to have our kids be obedient or they're going to get in trouble. So I do think we have to also recognize there are going to be cultural differences and, you know, a lot of differences as we go to different nations. But we are starting to understand this. Ask questions, make life a little bit more ambiguous, and let the kids solve some problems. Definitely. I, I can see you nodding, Olka. And then I, I want to go to Miguel because I'm, I'm hoping that he can talk a little bit about what this looks like in practice too. So, but Olka, I can see you nodding. So yeah. yeah. No, there was so much interesting there. So I just, there were like two or three things that I wanted to lob out and we can either take them or not. But I've been reading two books recently that have me thinking slightly differently um, in ways that are consistent with what you said. So the first is called The Divided Brain, mm -hmm. uh, by Ian McGilchrist. And the second is The Body Keeps the Score, which is a book around trauma and complex trauma. And um, the divided brain talks about how the left and right hemispheres engage with the world differently. And the left hemisphere is very kind of narrow. I know, Kathy, you're like, you've got your head in, but you could, you could just, but um, it's very narrow and it kind of goes in and you, you kind of hone in, abstract the world. You kind of, um, it's a kind of filter funnel that goes down. 
the right hemisphere is this kind of broad toggling of sort of like taking in lots of disparate things, um, lots of experientially, um, kind of experiential, bodily, lived experiences. And that part of creativity and curiosity is actually the interplay between those two, that it's not that one is more important than the other. And I think that's about your process versus outcome, Kathy, but that you're mm -hmm. going back and forth and the need to have mm -hmm. different modalities of engaging in the world, different ways of kind of engaging with ideas or experiences. I think we tend to often think about these things as mental things, um, but embodied experience and physical experiences yes. like you're trying to create in your piazza, yeah. right, are incredibly important in nurturing creativity and curiosity. And so the la you know, the other thing that makes me think is what are we taking off the table? Because if it takes time and experience and the ability to engage in the world, I think in schools, as we think about nurturing maybe rather than kind of teaching, but as we think about nurturing creativity and curiosity, what are we taking off the table to mm -hmm. give the time and to give the space for right. these different types of experiences, these different kind of modalities of putting ideas together in new ways, sometimes that work, sometimes that don't. And then the last thing I'll say is just this notion of curiosity, you know, equity, and I, my, I started teaching in Newark, and we work a lot with kind of communities of color and communities that have been oppressed and marginalized in our in our um, country. And I think there is a real fear about what happens if our, ch our children are not taught to do the things they need to do in the way that they do them or s are supposed to do them for fear of what's going to happen to our children. And so as we have this conversation about creativity, about curiosity, about how we change education, progressive education has always existed and been accessible to middle class more privileged families in this country. And I think when we try and have these conversations inside of communities that have more to lose, um, it, is, it is a much different conversation to have. And I think, at least for me, it's important to recognize the very real fears that sometimes are attached to, yeah, but I don't quite understand what this is and how is this going to either prepare my child or potentially put them in situations that are more difficult for them um, later on down the line. Oh, yeah. Can I just add two comments to what you said? Sorry, Julie, I didn't mean to butt in. That's all right. Two, two quick comments. Um, the first is, wow, I love it. <laughs> and I think the embodied experience approach is just, oh, it's so great. And we need to think more about it. Um, but, you know, these approaches, and I think one of the reasons that they're so scary, aside from the response I got from my friend in China, um, it is also that it involves living with failure and living with uncertainty. And those are uncomfortable for a whole lot of people. And I think you've nailed it. Failure is a bigger deal if you have tons more to lose. So I think your perspective is really valuable. The other thing that I think is really valuable, I don't know, you know, neuroscientists are still charting it out, but they don't seem to think there's as big a division as we used to think. But what you're absolutely dead on about um, is the new stuff I've seen coming out suggests that it is about making more connections and that there are actually, I guess, brain areas that are called default areas. I didn't know about these till last year, but apparently they're areas that also can connect more stuff and they seem to re be recruited when you're doing creativity. Yeah, great. Yes, I think, I've, boy, there's a lot going on here and I, I've, I'm, I'm a little bit dizzy about which way to go, but I think I wanna, I, I, do, I do wanna pull you in, Miguel, because I think no that you know, what, what you're doing with your school is, um, I, I just think it's the embodiment of this conversation because I think it's giving kids, it's giving learners um, a way to sort of express the diversity of their experience and their own creativity with their hands and with their minds to solve problems and 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 to do things that are important to them because I think one of the I think one of the things that I think we're all sort of talking around a little bit is purpose mm -hmm. and 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 we all need this this sense of purpose in our creativity, or I think it is something that perhaps should be limited because wild, wide open creativity for, you know, not so great purposes, not such a great thing. But when we have a sense of purpose and importance in our, in our work and in our play and in our, our learning, I think everything changes. And I think that's something that you're doing, Miguel. Can you talk about what it looks like? 
on the ground? Yeah, I, I definitely can. And I also just want to like build upon what Olka was, was kind of sharing about, um, you know, about the equity element of this in the sense that like, I really do think that the equity point in this is that like knowledge is a social capital and there's a lot of fear when you give people social capital. And I think that that's something that systematically is, is really fascinating within the education system itself. Um, because not only is there fear of having a nonlinear path and failure, but there is fear of like social capital when knowledge is, is abound. And um, I think that really plays super interestingly with the thoughts around, um, you know, progressive education being accessible to the middle class and the upper class, but not so much for um, underserved communities. So just an interesting thought to build upon there, Olka. Um, and then the the other piece, and Olka teed me up for this, so thank you for it, is like, what, what, um, what do you have to give up? Um, you know, because there's a give and take. And I really do think that as we explore the ideas of, of curiosity and creativity, um, the, the construct of time starts to, to become the challenge, right? Because oftentimes in education, we are in this, we have to catch up or we're behind or, you know, where are we going? Like, what is that outcome and where are we going? And that's the piece that I think that we need to challenge is because to give the nonlinear path of creativity and curiosity to have the space to come to fruition, you have to challenge the concept of grades, of yeah. time, of starting students on, you know, you were born on this day, so you're in first grade or you're in eighth grade, right? And begin to actually meet the learners where they're at in their learning continuum, right? And so at Embark, that's, that's how we approach our learning is we, we approach our learners about not what age they are, but where they're at in their learning journey um, towards the outcomes of becoming a better human. And we're able to do that, um, you know, through building solid relationships and then meeting them where they're at and then giving them the time and space um, to be able to fully see their curiosity to fruition and see the outcomes, right? In our shops, um, what that might look like is, you know, we begin with the big questions as, as people have um, have alluded to and asking the questions rather than directing the learning and then allow them to actually see those come to play. So a good example is that um, we are rebranding our coffee shop and we asked our students like, well, what, what does that mean and what, how does that impact business? Our students went out and they started to explore and visit different coffee shops around the Denver metro area and actually tied that directly to what set how authors craft setting and stories and novels, but then took it like took that academic concept and then tied it back into the real world and saying, okay, well, what, what do we want the experience to be here at our coffee shop? And then not, so not only taking that curiosity and that wonder, but then having the application and they've been working with our team of, of our marketing team and our coffee shop team to actually bring this to life and try out different ideas and see the implications of the decisions that they're making, which that ultimately takes time. Mm -hmm. But this non-siloed approach, you're, you're doing everything at once. You know, I think sometimes we think we're, you know, if, if we are moving through the day and we're doing one thing at a time, that that's not the way life works. And so that non that a non siloed approach actually saves time. And 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 you're doing more than one thing. And that's the way the world is. You know? It is. And it's also it's also how we as adults function. We don't work in siloed time periods, um, oftentimes through our days, right, we approach it and we kind of bounce across different types of things. And so you know, I approach each day at Embark with wondering with the question to myself and to my team around like, well, how are we approaching our learning today? And hopefully it does follow a nonlinear path. Yeah, I, 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 think, we've, I think we've undervalued the, the phrase, I don't know, right. as, adults, right. as adults, as facilitators in the classroom. And I wonder if, if we could talk a little bit about how we can take that back and help, help families, help, help you know, families who have fear about whether their children are going to do better than they've done um, or, or are going to do okay at all, how we can help them to understand that, you know, working from this place of, I don't know, 
I don't know yet is a powerful place, not a weak place. I see Wendy looking like she was. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Now, what do you think, of Wendy? Well, I'm really, um, this idea of I don't know, and I'd really love to link that to what um, Olka and Miguel have just been talking about with time. And I don't know how I'm going to use my time when I embark on a curious exploration or a journey of, of creativity. And I think it's interesting because the research I've done for my, my book on curiosity, I really kept coming back again and again to that concept of time, that how we we overly structure time or our ethos of efficiency has really killed, you know, the opportunity to delve into um, curious exploration because that those things don't happen on a on a time block. They happen very in, they happen in ways that surprise us as learners and, and picking up on what Kathy said earlier about that ambiguity or the uncertainty around around failure. Those are sometimes uncomfortable places to sit, but I think we have to sit through those. It, it makes me think of the, um, the Summerhill School in the UK, you know, the, the democratic schools that don't have a curriculum and getting bored. Boredom is actually on their mission statement. They want the kids to get bored. And so we think of boredom as this enemy, you know, and we're so afraid of it, I feel, in our, in our kind of efficient society and checking boxes and that I, I think getting bored can lead to an immense creativity is working through and getting into that place of, of ambiguity is where all the ripeness really is. But if we're afraid, we're so afraid that we quick, 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 get through it, get through it, through it you know, do something, um, do something that's going to be profitable or something that's going to be produce an outcome, you know, learning. outcome. I hate the word learning outcome. Sorry for <laughs> educators. I hate that that phrase because because it's like some some tangible product in a in a capitalist economy and I just don't think that's how curiosity works at all I think sitting in the interesting ambiguity and then getting to somewhere and that's that I don't know space that you're speaking of Julie it's that it's the comfort with ambiguity that lets us really drop in and get into something like a flow state or you know lose track of time get carried away with something if we're if we're never allowing kids to do that i think we're that's why we're not getting there in school school has become the opposite of of letting kids get carried away go ahead go ahead Olga. no you go, go ahead, ahead. ahead. Are you sure? Okay. Well, I was just, that just touches some, uh, something I was just going to, to say. One is that um, when we don't know something, there are really two choices. I want to know, and I want somebody else to know it for me. Okay. So, so this is, uh, I think this is, uh, that's a very important thing. I, I like to emphasize that is that uh, because of this idea of time, individuals have to specialize, have to pick an area they want to go. I think right now, the, why our schools are so bad, the many schools, maybe your schools, Miguel, your schools are okay, I guess, you know, is that uh, we, we try to make sure everybody knows everything we prescribe for them. You know, th that's a big problem. And we want to make sure they know that at the certain time, given the age of your, your birth. So that was, I think that's the big problem. I think, so what I'm really interested in thinking about is to say, can individuals specialize? And they do anyway. When they grow up, they actually do. So this is the, the, the irony of our thinking in education is that, so what, what do you do when people say, I don't know? And I don't know is fabulous, really, just to say, because I'm, I have but decided to say, I'm not going to know many things. And I don't, and there are many things I don't even want to know. I have no idea. I, I, just, I will allow somebody else to do it, or I don't even care. So I think that's another thing that families and teachers, uh, and, and they're struggling. They, they try to say, okay, because school prescribed the set of context. You must know this by this time. No, you don't. So that, that's, so that's, I think, where I just want to add that piece. So great. Go so, ahead, Alpha. Yeah. You know, so if I can just, so two things. Uh, the first is, I do think at some point, like this idea of our comfort or discomfort with I don't know is actually a serious kind of piece. I'm a philosopher by training, and so I kind of sometimes scale up to 20,000 feet. And in some ways, the industrial model of education that everyone loves to kind of bash these days emerged out of a worldview that was very much about trying to take the world and 
make it certain, right? And figure out like, what is this? How does the machine work? How do we navigate it? And we are now trying to bolt on this notion of creativity and curiosity onto a system that in some ways emerged out of a, a mindset that was much more about kind of structuring and codifying and making things rigid. And I think this question of how we can be com comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty gets to the heart of who we as adults have to be and how we have to persuade other adults and young children to be in a society that gives us these very different messages about whether that's okay or not. And there's a whole body in political psychology about kind of people's mindsets and comfort, comfort with ambiguity. And so to the extent that we wanna have this conversation in education, I think it's like a panel in and of itself and more, right? To actually think about what does it take to help people become more comfortable with this kind of moving, shaking foundation and what it'll take to get there, particularly in a moment where fear is a really driving principle, right? Because so many things are changing and people are feeling a need to kind of have some level of certainty. And then the, the other thing is, Young, I just wanted to respond to you. I think this question of content of schema of specializing and knowing things probably changes over time so children from zero to eight are in a very different place than kids from 13 to 18 or 24 and this notion of specialization and being able to go down one road and sort of say look i'm gonna really specialize and dig deep into these areas looks different the good thing for us is that kids between zero and eight naturally want to learn about all sorts of things and they want to know how ideas are connected to each other so i often say as an elementary school teacher like you give me your interest whether it's fire trucks or dinosaurs or clay beds or whatever and i can figure out how to teach you math and history and social studies and civics and all that through it but i just want to say that you know, knowledge is important and you need to have knowledge to be able to be creative. And so I don't also want us to go down the route or have people go down the route of being like, well, it doesn't matter at all. Um, and we've got to get kind of hit the right spot in between. Well, I think you're absolutely right about you can teach anything through any, any, any lens, right? And I think, you know, the zero to eight kids are the kids who have the best idea of how to be good learners. I mean, I'm, I'm mystified by, by how our society stops kids from saying why. You know, they, I think they call it the terrible force, but, you know, the, because kids are always saying why, 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 why. And that's considered to be a negative. And yet it's that why that propels them to understand absolutely everything about their world. And if they hadn't been asking why from zero to four in whatever way they ask why from zero to four, they would not know how to speak or to walk. So we are just, we're, we're slowing them down. We're putting the brakes on them because it's inconvenient. But why is that's 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 your engine i think you're you know to to return back to that but you know we might think that a life of creativity and curiosity is this wonderful you know end unto itself like it's so fantastic to live a life of curiosity and creativity and it is but you're right that's not all there is to it but a life without it is utterly empty. I mean, we, we, can't, we can't go on like that. So I guess my question, and it's for all of you, I was going to start with Jung, but how, how, how do we convince the stakeholders that the education that they, that they had, uh, you know, and we do often hear, you know, well, it was good enough for me. And when I say, you know, but you must wallow in the complexity, they look at me like I'm crazy. How do we convince stakeholders that this, um, that these are important pieces? How, how do we help them to understand that well, this- I, I think, you know, you're doing this. So, so uh, first of all, I really don't think uh, the decision makers, you know, there's no one decision maker. It's a bunch of them, you know, they come and go. So, so that, that's what, what, so what I'm interested in is influencing the public opinion. Mm -hmm. So what you are doing, what Miguel is doing, what we're all doing is to change in the opinion. And that opinion does not need a lot of details. And when that opinions change, policymakers will come in to change. So, so that's the, and the, the first part, second part, I think actually it's important, Julie, is to, to do what we are doing, to do what you are doing, is that the, it is the few creative individuals to create possibilities so others can see it. And others can, and then the, the more they see, the more they do. You look at, in, uh, uh, you know, Sir Ken Robinson, you look at High Tech High, you look at all these possibilities have been, Put up there, you know, and it's such amazing. You know, recent years, 
uh, how quickly a new idea gets spread across globally. I, I don't know if you noticed that. And that's very fascinating just to say, it just fa happens. So I think uh, people are dying for this kind of things. And, uh, and also the third one is that I, I'm, I'm I'm really getting old. I, I was I'm in my fifties, so I, I don't want to spend time to convincing people anymore. It's just too much trouble. <laughs> and, and so, what I'm interested in is doing things. Is to say, oh, whoever wants me to talk, I will talk, and and then people will come. I think that's a, it's a much a longer process uh, than we're trying to convince the policymakers. I think policymakers and systems respond to need. They never take the initiative to drive the change. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. I think it's parents that we're talking to a lot of the time. Exactly. Because if, if a we few can parents. Teach them, yes. You know, I think if they can see the value in what, in what we're saying. Well, and employers, employers. I mean, that is what we are hearing. We are hearing employers and parents and people who are out in the world exactly. doing things. Saying, and people in higher ed even. Yeah, right. The world is changing. We don't know what we're going to need. We don't know what the problems are going to be that we have to be trying to address. And so what we need is people who can be nimble, who can kind of turn on a dime, who can work together with other people who have different strengths, Yang, to your point. Like some people specialize in this and some people are great at this. Teams of people, right? That is, so I think leveraging this moment, the, w, the WHO, McKinsey, the World Bank, everybody's put out things that are saying what we say, I think. And I think parents in this generation, we've got an upcoming generation of, of parents. Um, who themselves, they're used to, wait, what do I need? What does my kid need? This standardized one size fit model is not what I need. I can get the right mattress firmness. I can get the pillows I want. I can get, everything can be bespoke. And I want my kid's education to be bespoke. So how do we give parents the language and the, the courage to sort of advocate for what they believe their kid needs? Yeah, I just wanted to chime in because I think you said a couple of really, really important things, Alka. Um, the first of which is that creativity doesn't just come. It's not just petering around, but you have to know a lot in order to be creative in what you're doing. And I think one of the best examples and ways to think about it for me is that COVID has really offered us tons of new ways of thinking and possibilities, things that I don't know that as a society we ever appreciated before. So let's think about it for just a moment, a thought experiment, and I'll tell you where I'm going. I have, I have often believed that um, because our education system was derived when it was in response to an industrial period, essentially we built what we call the horse and buggy of education. Okay, and as time marched on, we realized things were changing, and so we thought, hmm, well, we now have better tires. Let's put bigger tires on the horse and buggy. And then, you know, when we could have a motor, we thought, oh, this will be exciting. Let's add a motor to the horse and buggy, and then the horse and buggy will go faster. But eventually, you realize no matter what we do to the horse and buggy in its current shape, it's not going to be a Tesla. And if we want a Tesla education for everyone to prepare them for, you're so right, Alka, what the employers are asking for, then we need to kind of change the way that we think about stuff. All right, so how is COVID helping that? <laughs> because I always like to look at the positive. Well, I think for one, um, we have a lot of experts out there, people who know a lot, who are working on vaccines right now. But what they didn't have is a ready mix in their back pocket. They didn't have that. The number of unknowns is shatteringly high. And these people are able to deal with those unknowns, flexibly deal with those unknowns, again, what Alk and Young were saying, and to put together novel solutions based on the stuff that they already knew. So they're being deeply creative. And at last count last week, I think there are 118 vaccines that they are currently testing on the market, um, some of which have gone, as you know, to human trials. Wow, these are scientists working at their prime. And isn't that what we want? The second thing that it's taught us is what Wendy talked about, the power of boredom. 
my daughter-in-law who has a five and a almost three year old i'm my son too uh but she told me that the very best thing that her kids have gotten out of covid19 is that they're learning how to be bored before we filled their moments as parents every moment because we thought it had to be scheduled and all of a sudden we're in a world where it can't be scheduled anymore so all of a sudden after week one when i think they watched frozen two maybe a million times certainly over 10 um now they're not watching television anymore they don't even want to see a movie and they don't want to see a show because they have better things to do they're building castles and forts with all the amazon boxes that are coming to the front door and i think that's more productive and they're learning in my mind you know how to be bosses and i think we have a very exciting opportunity if the policy makers don't usurp us by saying and here is the perfect time to move online which it is not the perfect time for we've needed to do it because we had to do it for this moment but hopefully we're not going to have to continue person to person in Miguel school, doing what needs to be done to figure out the problem of rebranding. I love it. Yeah, I think, <laughs> Kathy, what I think um, I've seen is that there's this opportunity to see an actual shift in values and beliefs of what education is and can mm -hmm. be, right? Like that, um, I was in a conversation recently with with some fellow educators and they were they were talking about how parents for the first time actually see their children as learners yes. right through this homeschool piece it is the best parent teacher conference we could ever have yes right because we're no longer telling parents this is what we're seeing with learning but parents are actually seeing the learning take place the frustrations with it the struggles with it the triumphs of it whatever it may be parents are actually seeing it in this moment yeah. and so now is a, a, a really prime opportunity to be able to to harness that and not let this moment slip past us in being able to, to leverage it and move, move it forward. So. And Miguel, I would bet that they're also really appreciating teachers more. <laughs> you know? No, I mean that seriously. You know, I, I wrote one piece, it was a blog for Brookings, and it was something like, I bet your preschool teacher is worth a lot more now than they were you know, two months ago. <laughs> I was actually curious about that, that point, Miguel, uh, when you're talking about the teachers, because, you know, technically, I'm just thinking about technically, okay. Uh, it's only been two months in the U.S., school closed down. You know, summer used to be last in the slum. Why did that summer have the same impact? You had camps. Right. You had summer camps. You had, like, you no, know, seriously, like, you, and, and somehow it was like the, it was the hiatus, but by the end of summer, everybody was ready, right? I mean, I know I, like the last three weeks of summer, you're like, oh my God, they're going back to school. But I think it wasn't, I think what's interesting now is that it's an unknown, this is going to be the way it's going to be for a really long time, up close, personal, and intense in a way that summer wasn't um, for many, for many families. Yes, yeah, summer is just pretty carefree. And I think um, families are, are filled with care right now. I think okay, so you see the idea about, uh, how we have uh, chunked our time in, mm -hmm. in history, right? Human beings have this defined time. If it's this time, you're supposed to be learning. If it's June, July, we're okay. So this is actually what, what's, what's interesting about this is uh, we chunk our time. We have uh, like time off, we have curiosity time, we have creativity time, yes. we have learning time. So we have that timing in our thinking about how it works. It's interesting that you say that because I, I have to say that when, when, we, when we're at school, we, we always say to the children, you know, no matter where you are, you're learning. If you're on the school bus, you, the school bus is your school. If you're at home, your home is your school. If you're in the piney woods out back, that's your school. You're always learning. So you might as well stop compartmentalizing where you're a learner because we're always all learning. Whether you think you're learning or not, you're learning something. And so um, it's interesting to me, this idea, and, and I, I wholeheartedly agree, we do chunk our time, but 
but why? And, and why do we say we can learn in, in a school, but we can't learn out on the, mm -hmm. you know, out on the, on, on the blacktop or on the, in, in the woods? Why, are, why isn't every place a school? Well, but, but, I think it's in, but I think it's important to remember that that is a fairly recent construct. I was reading Jill Lepore's book, These Truths, and like the exportation of some of these right. ideas, right? Indigenous cultures, cultures that existed before we decided that education was this thing you took children out of the world, out of their families, out of their communities, stuck them in a box mm -hmm. and educated them. The way in which we educated our young was for them to live. Mm -hmm. Their lives live in, in the world and kind of learn that way. And so it's a fairly recent construct. And so in some ways, as we're thinking about going forward, we're actually thinking about going back yes. to a much deeper human way of being, right? The way humans have be, human beings have been for tens of thousands of years, as opposed to just a few centuries. And so I don't know if that makes it easier or worse, but I think, again, from a to put the lens of which cultures, which communities, whose wisdom and knowledge do we consider is important? You know, my friend Paola was kind of saying, you know, in this moment, everyone's running around, everyone in power is running around with their head, you know, like chickens with their heads cut off, being like, oh my God, learning loss, learning loss, learning loss. She's like, you know what? This is how we live. She's like, our kids are with our families. We're talking, we're reading, we're cooking, we're doing. She's like, my kids are learning. So stop kind of telling us that all of our communities are sort of have kids who are falling behind. So I think it's an important piece of this conversation to keep that in mind, like whose definition of education and learning have, are we privileging and what are we trying to go back to? And I think that goes back to this question too of like the policymakers and the powers that be, the blue school, the portfolio school, some of the most amazing progressive private schools are the schools that do exactly what we're all saying is important. So it's not that people don't know that this is important. The people in power and the people of privilege have often known, you know, have known this. Mm -hmm. It's are we willing to make it accessible and available to everybody because it is the type of education that creates leaders and, you know, the people who have power and the capacity to contribute to society. So Miguel, to your point, right, that's an important piece of this as well. Well, there's something so interesting about uh, COVID-19 and, and the way that it's helping to go back to Kathy's um, idea of, you know, what, what is this, what is this doing for us positively? And I think that speaks to what you're saying, Olka, with the, um, the sort of philosophical uh, lens, you know, who are we? What are our frames? What are we comfortable with? And what are we not comfortable with? This is letting us, it's sort of pulling back the curtain on us suddenly. We get this view of, oh, what, what do we do? You know, how, how am I spending time with my children? What do we value? What are we doing? You know, and so I think, I think with curiosity and creativity, we, we sometimes do this talk like, oh, it's, we think it's so valuable, it's so great, but you know, at the end of the day, I want my, I want my outcomes or I want my deliverables. And I, I think we're suddenly seeing that, you know, that, that the, the emperor has no clothes or revealed to us what our, our values are. And way back to your point earlier, Julie, of why are we stopping kids from saying why and why are we stopping them from asking questions? I think because ultimately the, the setup of school is that teachers ask the questions, you know, and we see that in the developmental psych literature, we see kids ask an average of 160 questions per day um, before they entered the K through 12 system. And then there's a dramatic decline. By second grade, it was down to what, zero to five questions in a, in a day. So, so the message, the implicit message is the teachers ask the questions in school. And I see that in higher ed too. I feel like people who want to run, you know, I want to run a democratic classroom. I want to run a seminar, but here are the questions. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, not a, that's not a flattening hierarchy. The right. students have to ask the questions and those have to be, have just as much weight as the so-called expert questions. You know, we, if we really do want to get rid of privilege and power, and we really want to reframe these things, then we really need to, um, you know, acknowledge our, our biases in that area and say, hey, what you want to study is just as important as what I want you to study, actually, what you're interested so in. Like, uh, we get that's going to be challenging the entire, uh, the foundation of the current education system. So that, that's what uh, Let's do it. I think as uh, <laughs> Oka was saying that you got to get rid of everything. So, so forget about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Time for a Tesla. Tesla education. Here we go. Well, isn't equity respecting everybody's, you know, learned knowledge? I mean, it's not, it's, it's not privileging, you know, what one person, one person's experience is greater than another. I mean, the problem solving experience of, of one group is not greater than another. We're but, just but solving I think, uh, uh, Julie, the, the problem with, with anything we're talking about today, when it goes to the traditional model of schooling or education, it won't work. Because, you know, when you say, when you respect everyone, you can't because you know now this everyone is gathered based on where they're located unlike your school and Miguel's school it's different you know so that is uh, that group may never we should ne even not be together but they are together so you can't really do that anyway the, we can take another <laughs> five hours to go through the whole Actually, process. I want to yeah, build on that point I mean First of all, you know, the learning occurs everywhere. Gosh, I've spent so much time on that because I totally agree. But if we don't point it out to the kids, then actually the truth is they can't generalize anything and it's stuck in the moment. So, I, you know, it's not just learning occurs everywhere. That's a little too vague for how it really happens. The second thing is we have to be fair. And I'm going to take maybe a diametrically opposed view to what you all think as far as what is the liberal view. But here is my take on the liberal view. I very much believe that I have to help every kid in every community, especially from under-resourced communities, succeed in the world that they have to enter. Okay? And guess what? That means that everyone's stuff is not equal. It doesn't mean that some people are terrible and some people are not. It doesn't go by class barriers. But what it does mean is if you don't have certain minimums of understanding, if you don't have a good enough reading level, and gosh knows we don't test that well, so let's just skip that now. Um, if you don't have the suite of skills, and I don't think those suite of skills is just reading in math. In our book, Becoming Brilliant, we put out the scientific evidence for what we, what we think are six different skills, learning how to collaborate and work in teams. Every business person is telling us it's important. Learning how to communicate, to listen, to write, to speak. Nobody talks about being ordered or having speaking in your classrooms anymore. Okay. Content isn't just about what you memorize. It's about what you can use. And it's about learning to learn skills so that you can learn something new for the jobs that don't exist yet. Creativity is built on content and communication and collaboration. And then you have confidence and creativity. So I think to be fair, and we're trying this right now with using those six C's, um, we've created an education system that values creativity and curiosity as much as it does communication, as much as it does your math score. Mm -hmm. But in so doing, we believe that a better and more well-rounded person who you graduate from a school in a kind of profile of a graduate which I think is an interesting exercise that was put forth by the 21st century folks, is, is a great way to go. And I bet, and this is what we have seen in our field in developmental psychology, is that when kids do better in the suite of skills, guess what? They also do better in the particular tests that a lot of folks want to give them. But it is our charge not to just allow the rich kids to break away from all the rest, but to make sure that our methods work for everyone and that what we do at the Slate School can be implemented just as well in a school that has 80% free lunch and is 80% Hispanic or Latino. I gotta add one thing, Kathy. So just, you know, just, you know, not for nothing. Yeah. Uh, the model here at Slate School, 100% need blind admission, and we meet 100% of demonstrated financial need. So Slate School has a very rich and diverse group here. 
Fabulous. This is not a school for children of privilege. Um, the, the trick is helping people, all kinds of people, understand the value of this. Right, right, right. For kind sure. But, but I also, that is not the, that's, that's challenging. Well, but I do also, not a I, small ask. Yeah. I do want to say, though, that I think we haven't mentioned neurodiversity, and I just also want to be clear, right, that some of our canons, I, it's funny, I'm a reader, I love reading. I've got a son who doesn't love reading. He loves to watch videos, he loves to hear things, he likes to, speaking is a way of demonstrating what I know, even if I can't write long essays, right? Doing is a way of knowing, and we don't privilege it, which is why we think the trades are less important than your sort of four-year graduate degree. So I think in this conversation, recognizing, valuing, and really building for neurodiversity, different ways of knowing, different ways of learning, different ways of demonstrating knowledge is super important. And I think that's why these conversations are so challenging because yes, the world is the way it is and the world is changing and it's a choice what we make it to be. Yeah. And so we're trying to do all those things all at the same time um, for all the kids who need it. So. Yeah, you just have to figure out the transition plan. Mm -hmm. right? And unless your unless your society, you know where it's going, then I think it's really, really hard to just say, I abandoned everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to figure out how to help people get up the stairs. What do you know what your percentages are actually at the Slate School? You must. Um, I, mean, I have a whole new class coming in, but we have we have many we have we have eight languages here. Fabulous. We have 23 students this year. Yeah, but I meant more economic diversity. 99% uh, of the students at Slate School receive significant financial aid. That's wonderful. That is truly wonderful because I don't think that's common. Mm -hmm, no. I think for most of the progressive schools, I don't think, even the ones my kids went to, um, and they did a similar thing with applications, but very few kids applied to go. You know, we gave a lot of financial aid to the kids who wanted to come, but given its location, given the outreach, given who we were able to, you know, get to, and what the parents thought of it, we were fighting a lot of uphill battles to get those, you know, get the folks who really could have benefited from it to be there. I think well, also, uh, sorry, oh, go ahead, go ahead Wendy. I'm time, but I just want to say that I think that um, this has to do with the freedom and the ability to be creative that our teachers are afforded or not afforded. Yeah. In the yeah. So I think that that many teachers, you know, I train future teachers, and I think that most of them want to do all of these wonderful things that we're talking about, and they they're so filled with, oh with gosh, yes. and ideas and um, you know just brilliant brilliance and. And they get into this world where they're railroaded into a certain ethos that is is not at all what what they believe. Exactly. In. And so I don't even think it's it's money. You know, I, I don't even think it is money because I think there are you know you can run a Montessori classroom with thirty students and one teacher. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not even the ratios as much as it's the the teachers need academic freedom. The K through twelve teachers need to be curious themselves. And and you know the research really shows that you know, back to your original question, can it be taught? Can curiosity be taught? That's up for debate, but can it be squashed? Yes, <laughs> we know it can be squashed. <laughs> the number one way to squash it is to have the teachers not be curious themselves, right? If you're teaching out of a box, if you're teaching, if you're, if you're being forced into what to teach, then you yourself, you lose your own spirit very quickly. And we see burnout so quickly with, with K through 12 teachers. I mean, opening it up, to the creativity of the teachers and really trusting them, I think would be a huge revolution in, in what we're doing for, for all students and all teachers. Well, what Wendy said, uh, that, that's worth the whole day. So that, that's, uh, <laughs> my work has really been not focusing on helping people to get better, but try to, how, try to help other people to relieve so far, to remove the actions we take that tries to putting out curiosity and the capacity for creativity. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, as expected, uh, this conversation could go uh, much longer. And um, I'm, I'm confident that although we didn't solve the problems today, at least maybe we're talking about them in ways that get us thinking about it.
uh, that increase our lens and help us to understand other people's point of view and also to get people who might not be considering this as 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 such a big as such a big topic as it as it truly is um, it's hard to believe that we've gone over time, uh, but this is the end of our time for this panel. I want to thank so much from the bottom of my heart this, this incredible panel for your generous wisdom, sharing of your time, um, and thank all of you who have joined us as well. Um, and we will just close this hour as we close all of the meetings at Slate School with our students. I'll just say, you know, thank you so much to all who have joined us and positive rice to all of you. Have a great day. <laughs>